The world is crowding our souls with noise. Messages, notifications. They begin when our alarm goes off in the morning and continue until we go to sleep at night. The problem is, so much of what we see and hear, the endless information we encounter, it's just noise. It doesn't matter. It's meaningless. But what God has to say to us through His Word, through prayer, through His people, that's different. That's what matters. His presence. It's rest for our weary souls. It's peace for our worried minds. It's hope for our troubled hearts. We don't have to earn His attention. We don't have to work for His love. It's already ours. It is freely given. He's waiting for us to be with Him. There is nothing more important. Nothing matters more than being present with God. All right. Well, guys, we are so excited to be here worshiping with you, each one of you today, uh, and enjoying the baptism earlier, as well as the music and praising his name, uh, and now just going to his word and learning a little bit, but applying it to our lives and seeing God work in mad, majest, majestic ways. Uh, God is waiting for us to be with him. Nothing matters more in life than being closer to Jesus and being present with God. Uh, we're talking about doing a series called Retreat. Um, and so the idea here is to get alone with God, is to spend time with Him. Some of you may be thinking vacation. So real quick, I did this a couple weeks ago, but real quick, who would vacate at the beach? Put your hand up if you could choose, okay? All right, hands down. Who would vacate, vacate at the mountains? All right, all right, hands down. Who doesn't want to do it at all? Yeah, right. Okay, all right, nobody back there. Yeah, so here's the idea, and you're probably married to one or the other one, you know, somebody enjoys uh, going to the beach versus someone enjoys going to the mountains, but the truth that I'm trying to portray here is not getting out somewhere to go off someplace, you know, like that. It's not a vacation. We're talking about retreating yourself from the everyday normal aspects of life, the things that go on, so that you can spend a little time with God. For some people, that looks like a night and a day. For other people, it looks like just a couple hours in an evening where nothing else is happening. Uh, it could be something entirely different for all of you, but we're dealing with this idea of retreat. The word comes, or word means to evacuate, to withdraw, to pull back, to go away, or to hide. Um, and if you think about it in terms of uh, even like a, 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 uh, an army retreating from battle, you know, that's the idea, but they're going to find what? to find peace, because if they remain there, they're going to be wiped out. Well, that is a lot of the way it is with our lives. If we remain with all of our struggles and trials and things that we're dealing with in life, we're going to probably be worn out and done away with. And sometimes we just need to retreat, just get away from it all. A place that a person goes for peace, a haven, or a sanctuary, a time away with God. You and I need this. And if you haven't experienced this in a long time, let me encourage you, do it this week. Find a time, whether it's the first day of every month, it's the first day of the week, whatever, whatever it is for you, get alone with God. A couple weeks ago, because we had, well, some snow last week, but enough to cancel services, which I can't stand. But anyway, um, two weeks ago, we talked about a mountaintop experience, talked about Moses and how Moses went through uh, being able to see uh, the after effects of God's glory as he came by, the way I like to say it. And he experienced God, heard a long name that God had given and it impacted him. His face shone. He went down back into the camp of Israel, not just for like that afternoon, but for apparently days on end with a face that was shining every time he'd go and retreat himself into the presence of the Lord. And so today we're talking about a cave rendezvous. Yep, some fancy work has a Z in it and you can't even hear it, okay? Cave rendezvous is the title of this sermon. And we're talking about Elijah. 
All right? And so for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize a lot of what happens to get us to where we are. And so in, 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 we won't go there now, but in chapter 17, uh, Elijah predicted a drought. There was a widow of Zarephath who had a son. Uh, they didn't have any food or anything like that. And he said, well, will you bake me a cake? And she said, well, we're going to die after we eat the one that I'm about ready to make. But sure, you can have it uh, kind of deal. And then she, he, she ends up giving it to him. Uh, he ends up blessing them and saying that her oil and, and, and flour and everything will not go out all the while before that there would be rain um, and, and so forth. And then you get to chapter 18 and the famine was so severe that Ahab ends up meeting with Elijah. And, um, and there's this meeting that's gathered. And it's, if you read between the lines, all of Israel's invited to that meeting. Okay, so all of Israel's up on this mountain, Mount Carmel. There's 450 prophets of Baal. There's 400 prophets of Asherah. And they're all up on top of this mountain, okay? And so real quick, in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 22 says this, Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull and lay on it the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. By the way, capital letters, L-O-R-D, that is Yahweh, very specific name for God in the Old Testament for Him. Um, and it says that I will call upon the name of the Lord and God who answers by fire. He is God. Okay, and so it goes on, and many of you who might know the story, and if you don't, just kind of tag along with me right now, and maybe go back and check it out. But bottom line is they end up for like six hours or more um, crying aloud. That is the prophets of Baal and Asherah and everything, and they're cutting themselves, which you think is kind of weird, but it's actually what they did in worship um, in, in those days and stuff. They would cut themselves as if it, like asceticism would be getting them closer to God, and God would then hear them because they've sacrificed something above and beyond the bull and all these other kinds of things that happen. So for hours upon hours, they're crying aloud, cutting themselves, um, all the way till past noon. And Elijah's sort of mocking him in between. You have all that going on. And then finally, after all that, Elijah's like, all right, can, can I just go ahead and do my thing? I mean, we've heard you guys long enough before the day's going to be out. Nothing's really took place. It's about time. And of course, he makes jokes about the God sleeping or whatever. And so his turn, he gets the wood, he gets the bowl, sacrifices the bowl. He gets four jars of water. Did y'all catch that there was a famine in the land? How do you think everybody, all of Israel, was responding to him dousing this thing with water? After they just went six or eight hours worth of not being able to call upon their God, they're thinking to themselves, my family's about ready to thirst to death, and there is no sign of rain in the forecast. They didn't have the weather channel like we do today. Um, but all these things are taking place. Four jars of water, three times. All the way over this thing. And then we read down in verse 37, and it says this, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, that is Yahweh, He is God, the Lord, He is God. All this has happened. Then there's more. It's not like it stops right there, okay? So they all of a sudden, after all this, they hear the sound of rain. Y'all ever been out there and like seen, have you, have you been out, especially our mountains are just beautiful by the way, uh, to look out and watch whether it's the snow or the rain coming, you can actually see it come. Out at the soccer field a couple, I think it was this past week, and uh, we literally saw the mountains up over the duck pond come, come the snow. And it was just a little bit, but it was while we were practicing, I think it was while we were scrimmaging, it was a lot of fun to see it, a lot of fun to play in it, but to watch it come, and even to hear it, you don't hear the snow, but to hear the rain coming, it's just a really, really neat experience. And they're hearing that, All they're, they're getting excited, they're saying, all right, we can't be stuck on top of this mountain, so Ahab, Ahab gets into his chariot, he rides all the way down, and it says that Elijah ran and beat him to Jezreel. Now, you have to read between the lines because you read that and you're like, okay, that's great. Yeah, there was a chariot. It went down a mountain. And Elijah ran and went faster than a chariot. Hold on a second. Elijah ran faster than a chariot? You know the distance from the top of Mount Carmel all the way to Jezreel? It's 25 miles. It's virtually a marathon. The dude ran faster than the chariot for a marathon. I, th I, think, I think God gave him some ability at that moment. It was pretty neat. Um, and that takes us to 1 Kings 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel 
all that Elijah had done, including the fact that he beat him on a foot race down the mountain, okay? And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger, a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. The threat from a powerful woman. Guys, that makes me scared just saying it. Okay? Whew. All right, it goes on. Then, verse 3, he was afraid. And he arose, ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Guys, he just like gave this woman, and by the way, I didn't even mention the fact that the widow's son had, had died, and he raised him back from life. And then gave the, the flour and the oil, all that his abilities. On top of that, he called upon the name of God. And he was the only one, apparently, all up there by himself. And all that took place. And then he ran 25 miles. He did all of that. And by the way, there's another 90 miles going to Beersheba from Jezreel. All this taking place. And he's afraid of a woman who says, I'm going to kill you by tomorrow. Is that really where he should be in his faith? I mean, if, if you just called fire down from heaven by just simply a quick prayer, don't you think you can handle this woman? God strike her dead. <laughs> yeah. it didn't, he didn't even try. There was no opportunity there. He didn't even give an attempt. But he was scared to death, wishing to die. An angel then comes to him and gives him a cake on hot stones and water to drink. After all that, I'm sure he was famished and ready to eat and drink. And, and all this took place. And he said, the angel told him, you're going to need this for the strength of your journey. And again, we read a, a verse in the Bible that we don't really understand. But he's going from uh, Beersheba all the way to Horeb, which is understood as Mount Sinai. A lot of scholars recognize that, which if you realize and look at the topography or the, a map, that's all the way down almost into Egypt in that peninsula that on the other side of the Red Sea where Moses went to Mount Sinai. So he's going all the way from almost the Sea of Galilee, down into the Dead Sea, where Beersheba was, and then beyond that, all the way down this peninsula, almost 200-something miles, through rocky terrain and mountains. So yes, he needed that. But I want you to know that he went that entire journey on a cake and some water. And that was it. And that takes us to where we are, skipping down to verse 9. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said... What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You guys get it? You understand where he's at? Low point in his life? You ever been there before? Ever had to just go alone and get out somewhere and just realize, you know, I got all this against me, whether it's my, my family or my spouse or my finances. And, you know, everything just seems like it's against me. My job, I just got fired. You know, whatever, whatever it is in your life, and you're to a point where nothing's going your way. You don't see any help. You don't see anybody putting their hand out to give you a hand. It seems like you're completely all alone. And we're not told how much time he's in that cave. It says he came to a cave and lodged in it. By the way, you come to a cave, what's the first thing you're going to do? Make a fire, right? It's dark. You've got to make a fire so you can see something. You've got to make a fire because you can stay warm because I don't care what time of year it is, a cave is going to be colder than the rest of everywhere else. And so he potentially then makes a fire, sits down by the fire, and he's there, we're not told, but he lodged in it at least the night, maybe a couple and the word of the Lord comes to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? You ever read those verses and chuckle? You think, doesn't God already know what he's doing there? I mean, didn't he like send the angel to tell him to go out that way anyway? Didn't he know exactly which cave he would camp out at? What fire he would build? Didn't, didn't God know all that? This is the exact same, same kind of question that God asked Adam and Eve. Hey, where, where are you? Doesn't he know where Adam and Eve are? Absolutely, he knows where Adam and Eve are. Uh, but the, the idea is similar there to in both those cases that God is calling to reassess their position. He's, there's an implied rebuke with those questions. There's, there's the idea of you need to confess exactly what's going on. Adam and Eve, where are you? Did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat? You, know, you, you see that. You know, Elijah, hey, what are you doing, man? 
Why, why did you come here? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I already know this, but it's because you, you think you're all alone. And you think that no one's here to help you. All these things that are happening. And so you see that through this initially, that Elijah is taking at least taking time to spend with God, as at least separating himself from everything else going on. Yes, initially from fear of Jezebel, okay? Um, from fear of a woman, certainly. But also just simply to hear from God. When is the last time that you took time out of your day to just hear from God? You know what I love about where I live? is It's just a walk in the backyard to go to the creek. And when I'm down there, the creek is the only sound I hear. It's loud enough over those rocks that everything else is drowned out. Even the chickens clucking are just sort of in the background. It doesn't matter. But I don't hear any kids. I don't hear, I don't hear my spouse. I don't hear my cell phone. I don't hear everything else in my life that takes my attention. By the way, all those things are great things. Nothing wrong with any one of them. It's just the fact that my life is so full of everything. Is your life much of the same? Ask somebody how they're doing today. Oh, I'm busy. <laughs> you know, how you been this week? How was this week? Oh, it's been a really, really busy week. And you know, frankly, you don't even want to hear anymore because you're like so busy that you really don't want to hear about their business because then you're just going to compare how busy y'all are and now you're going to fight. What's the point of that? Okay, the whole idea though is we've got to get away. And at least he got away. Reassessing who he was, but he uses this phrase in verse 10. He says, I've been very jealous for the Lord. I love that phrase. I think we lose it in the idea that jealousy is a bad thing. Um, the word jealous can mean zealous. You know, very much fervent in doing things for God. I've been very excited to be with God and to do things for God. But actually, this word can also kind of go from there to being angry and willing to fight for. Well, when's the last time you were willing to fight for Jesus? Not if it means I won't get my paycheck. Not if it means that I might offend so-and-so. Not if it means that I might lose someone as a friend. You have to think in your own life, where is your faith? Are you jealous for Jesus? Are you zealous for Him? Are you willing to fight for Him? What's awesome about today is the baptisms describe 10 people that were willing to do that today. 10 people said, yeah, I'm willing to fight for Jesus. I'll, in front of everybody, I'll dunk myself. I'm not going to say nothing except for Josh. You know. <laughs> but he said, but I'm willing to dunk myself and get wet in front of everybody because when I go underneath that water, I'm going to exemplify how, how literally my life is now in Christ. The way I once was is not the way I am anymore. And you walk in newness of life. It is a display of your faith. It is an, an aspect of being willing to say in front of everybody that they are believers. But in our real life, how do we do that? Each person's different. I could give 10 examples right now and never touch yours, okay? Everybody is so vastly different. There's social media that we could, we could talk about it. There's our work, there's our family, there's our friends, there's everything that goes on in our lives. But we need to be willing to show forth Jesus to all and everyone. Everyone we come in contact with. So the first thing is that we've got to be jealous for God. Second, we need, to, we need to realize that God is trying to talk to us. Look at verse 11. And he said, go out, stand on the mount before the Lord, and before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a slow whisper, a low whisper, that is. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out, stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, well, once again, what are you doing here, Elijah? So kind of going back and just dissecting this real quickly, you have this whole scene that takes place. He goes up on this mountain and he's standing there all by himself. God has told him to go up here. And as, he, as he's up there, he's, look, and it's amazing. It says a great strong wind 
tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks. Initially, because I just watched like the new Thor movie. I don't know if any of y'all have seen it. So my mind, there's a squirrel, okay? And my mind is thinking about this Thor movie when they throw the hammer and the hammer breaks into pieces and goes around everybody that it doesn't want to hit and hits everybody that it's supposed to hit and then comes right back and lands right here in the person's hand. And I'm thinking to myself, man, that's awesome. Of course, I want one of those. It doesn't exist. Um, but the point is here that all these things, you can imagine, the wind is tearing the rocks up. These things are swirling all around. Can you imagine being Elijah in that, sp- in that moment and realizing that his life is at stake? All it takes is one of those rocks to hit him in the eye or, or to hit him across the head or something like that. And yet he still, he just, he sits there and realizes, well, of course, I can't move. I can't do nothing. Um, but God is doing that on his behalf to show him something. That, as the text says, God's not in the wind. Okay, then there's an earthquake and that all takes place. And Well, God's not in the earthquake. And then there's fire. And if you were scared before, he's scared. If he weren't scared before, he's scared now. Now <laughs> it says that he's not in the fire. And of course, then it goes afterwards, and it says, after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And so when we think about that low whisper, I want you to think about this. In our life, we think God should reveal himself the way we think he should reveal himself. All right? I do it all the time. I go outside and look up at the sky, and I say, God, do you want me to? And you fill in the blank. Okay? And when you do that and you sit out there and you say, all right, clouds come together in a certain way. God, can you write yes or no? Um, check mark a box. Can you go ahead and just, you know, can you orchestrate something? Send a bird, poop on my car, um, do something. Let me know what I need to know at this moment. And you go out there on his terms, on your terms that is, not realizing that this is according to the way God wants you to understand information. He's not in the wind, he's not in an earthquake, he's not in a fire. And there's this little low whisper, which also indicates something else to me. It indicates the fact that God didn't go anywhere the whole time. It indicates the fact that he was probably whispering the whole time that the wind was flailing those rocks around, that the earthquake was happening, that the fire was raging. All that was taking place. And the whole time God was whispering, I'm right here, come to me. I'm yours. All you need is me. Stop worrying. I just lit the whole mountain on fire. I can take care of Jezebel. I'm good for you. I got this. The whole time God is saying these things, and everything in our life is keeping us from hearing Him speak to us. Guys, that's why we need to retreat. Just like Elijah did. Just like Moses did, so that we can hear this faint, low whisper, as it were. That we can see God by opening the pages of His words without any other distractions and being able to know exactly what God wants us to do. Elijah knew he was in the presence of the Lord because he covered his face. In verse 13, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and then again that voice comes to him and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? Number three point today and finals, you are not alone. Look what he says. Verse 13, or 14 that is. He said, I've been very jealous again, Elijah speaking, for the Lord, the God of hosts, the people of Israel forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, listen, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, we'll anoint... Hazael, Hazael to be king over Syria and Jehu the son of Nimshi you'll, you'll anoint to be king over Israel Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah you shall anoint to be prophet in your place and the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him alright you have to note a couple things First of all, he sent him on some missions to anoint Hazael and then to anoint Jehu and then to anoint Elisha. Not Elijah. This is, this is Elijah, okay? But Elijah anoints Elisha. But when he does that, he's, he's anointing someone who will take his place. All right? His ministry, as it were, is coming to an end. Now, all that being said, kind of going back, I want to ask you this question. You ever felt alone? You ever felt alone in your faith? 
in your life in general. Sure, everybody has at some point, okay? Um, nobody, you might say, nobody is going through what I'm going through. <laughs> you ever said that? I've, sa- I've said it. I've said it knowing that that's not the truth. As I'm saying it, no, that's not true. Nothing new under the sun, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. Surely, everything I've faced, somebody else has to some degree. And we want a pity party for ourselves at that time. And I think it's good to express emotions. I think it's good to talk about these things. I think it's good to cry out to God in these times. But someone somewhere is going through what you're going through or much worse. You say, man, that is so encouraging, Pastor Jay. <laughs> let, me, let me just say that in those encouraging words again. Someone somewhere is going through what you are or maybe even worse. You say, how's that encouraging? Well, to me, it actually is. And let me tell you why. Because if so-and-so is going through what I've gone through or going through, and they're on the other side of it and made it, I realize that I can too. I'm not the kind of person to say that somebody did something and then you can't. No, no, I want to. So if that person overcame, well, I want to overcome too. If that person dealt with whatever they're dealing with, well, I want to deal with with that too. (coughs) Excuse me. And so God gives Elijah this list. He goes forward and he's going to do that. But it's that last verse that I want you to catch. It says this, 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. What was Elijah's complaint? Twice we see in this immediate passage, once we read earlier. It's just me. I'm all alone. Nobody's doing this. I'm up there by myself on the mountain. Nobody's helping me out. It's no, everybody else is bowing down. There's nobody but me. And God says, let me put this person in power over there that you apparently don't think exists because you think it's only you. Let me put this person over there because you don't realize he exists either, that he can also be used by me. Then, by the way, Elijah, I think your time's about done. It's time you hand over the staff, as it were. Let's let somebody else take your place. And by the way, when all that's said and done, there's still at least 7,000 people that are not willing to bow for Baal, and you've missed all of them. You're not alone. You're not alone. You have people that are in this fight with you together, that are in this life together, that are through your struggles, your faith, your trials, everything. God has given us each other to live life with. I put a plug in in our baptism about our connection groups, but I'm going to put a plug in right now and just say this. We're supposed to live life together. If this is all we're doing is Sunday morning worship, and by the way, I love gathering together. I wish we could do this every Sunday you know, with this. I wish we could all sing, and everybody would show up to hear your voices and cry out to God with one voice. And I love being able to speak in God's Word and, and just listening to and growing from. Studying myself helps me to get closer to Him. I love all that, but that's for like an hour and a half a week. That's it. Where's the rest of our congregation? Where's the rest of our people? What are we doing with life? We're living life separate. Our connection groups are designed to help us live life together so that we know when someone is moving or when someone is struggling with their job or when someone has just lost a loved one or someone is fighting cancer, doesn't want everybody else to know, but is willing to tell their small group so we pray together as a small group. That's why we do it. We're meant to live life together. God is pleased, I believe, in a sense, with Elijah's jealousy, but he's not alone like he thought. And so we need to find time to spend with God so that we can learn how to better ourselves for Him and how to do His work. My encouragement to you this week is to find a cave rendezvous. And here's the deal. There's a bunch of caves in Giles County, but it doesn't have to be a cave. It can be a closet, which looks like a cave. It could be anything that you want to go into to separate yourself from everybody and everything else. And I'm going to challenge you to be jealous for the Lord. I'm going to challenge you to realize that God is trying to talk to you so you can listen and hear Him speak to you. And I want to challenge you that you are not alone in this. God's got you, and He's got many others willing to fight with you, alongside with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day, and thank You for Your Son. Pray that You would help us now as we worship you again and lord as we get ready to go our way that we would realize that we need jesus and we need to spend time with him help us lord and encourage us to be able to separate even an hour out of this week where it's just us and god everything else aside to have a cave rendezvous as it were a mountaintop experience and to be able to get closer to you and grow in our faith lord our faith is in jesus christ 
who came, who died, and who rose again. We believe that, the, that what he did was on our behalf and that he loved us so much and is the perfect sacrifice that, Lord, all we have to do is simply believe in what's already been done. That's what these 10 a few minutes ago did. They, they were able then to display that faith through their baptism, that is. And I just pray if there's anybody else in here who's never made that decision, that even today they would. And Lord, we'll fill the waters up next week, the week after, whenever we need to. But God, help us to truly worship you with our lives and to do all that we can to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.